Let's start in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. I want to speak to you today about God coming as a refiner's fire. Malachi, the third chapter. God says, I will send my messenger, which in Hebrew is Malachi, Malachi. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So notice, this is the one they are seeking. This is the one they desire. He will come suddenly, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? People are praying for visitation. They're crying out for God to come. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. And then, as the next verses tell us, he will come and bring judgment on the ungodly. These verses are quoted with regard to John the Baptist, John the Immerser, who prepared, excuse me, prepared the way for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is the one who came as a refiner's fire. Why is it that revival can be prayed for for years, but often we don't see it realized? Why is it people pray for God's visitation, but then when he comes, it's too much, and the ones that are seeking him now ask him to leave? Why does this happen? Many times we pray for revival to come, meaning something outside of us. God, save our schools. Boy, keep praying that. That's dear to God's heart. Amen. God, turn the heart of our nation. Yes, keep praying that. That's a good biblical prayer. God, our church buildings are empty. Bring in new people. Bring in lost. Bring in hurting. Amen. Pray for that by all means. And maybe we even realize our own hearts are cold. Something's lacking. And we need more of God in our lives. But more of God means radical change. More of God means that he will now come and do things in us that we did not necessarily ask him to do. We want the blessing. We want the anointing. We want the empowering. We want the gifts. We want the miracles. We want the prophecy. Praise God for all of that. But more than that, God wants our heart. God wants the transformation of our insides. And you see, a refiner's fire is a superheated fire. And, and you throw gold and silver into it. And when you look at that gold and silver, I, I look at my, my wedding band, 48 years of marriage, I look at my wedding band, it looks fine to me. But if you throw it in the refiner's fire, suddenly the defects will start coming up. Suddenly the muck and the mire will start coming up. And that's what happens when God draws near, and that's why many people resist it. And that's why God says, who can endure the day of his coming? Oh, Lord, visit our church. Oh, God, come touch us. Oh, God, light a fresh fire in me. And he does. And the next thing, the ugliness starts coming up. The junk, the sin. We may be aware of the outward sin. Maybe we want to get free from an addiction. Maybe we want some change in relationships. But we don't want God to uproot deep things in our character. Lord, you can go this far, but this is a little too personal. People get touched in revival. They love the service, awesome encounter with God. They don't realize that Jesus is now going home with them. Come on. We would see this pattern during the Brownsville revival, which was from 1995 to 2000 in Pensacola, Florida. We would regularly see this pattern that folks who lived in the community, church going folks, would come to the revival. And they'd be excited. God would touch them. But they say, pray for our kids. We got a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, the girls sleeping around, the guys in gangs. Pray for them. Pray that God will save them. And then they'd end up coming to a service. 
And like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of others, millions of others, they got touched, they got transformed. And now they're on fire for Jesus. And they're, they're going every service. And they get up early in the morning and praying. And, and they're sharing the gospel at school. And they come home from revival service. It's, it's midnight. It's one in the morning. And their mom and dad are watching TV. And, and the kid comes in and they're watching some movie. And it's unclean. It's got some sex scenes and profanity. And kids say, Mom, Dad, I thought you were Christians. And now the parents have said, Who are you to judge us? We've been Christian before you were ever born. It's like, well, not the Christian that I am now. Something happened. Change came. I'm not talking about that we walk around being judgmental of everybody, but I'm saying change will come. And, and often what happens is if a spouse starts to really press into God, goes after God, they're changed. We have one of two choices. We can either say they're fanatical or we can change too. God comes as a refiner's fire. And that means he brings things up inside of us that we didn't know were there. And it's uncomfortable, it's painful, it's embarrassing, it's humbling, but that was the junk that was in there anyway. It's God's love, he's not out to destroy us. If he wanted to destroy us, he would have done that a long time ago. It's his love bringing this to the surface because it's unhealthy. You know, when Jesus set me free from drugs, December 17th of 71, I was instantly delivered. Two years of intensive heavy drug use and then instantly delivered by the power of God. It was amazing. No withdrawal, no, he just set me free. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, when I knew I had to make a change in my lifestyle as a, as a decades long chocoholic and unhealthy eater, I knew I had to make a change in lifestyle. And, and I said, okay, this is it. I told my wife I need to make a change. And she said, all right, no food passes through your lips without my approval. I'm taking control of your diet. I said, all right, I, I know I need to make a change. So I gave up instantly all the bad stuff I had been eating for decades and decades and decades. I went through three miserable days of withdrawal. It was much harder for me to give up chocolate than heroin. I'm telling you the truth. And, and I don't know a lot about nutrition. I don't know about a lot of the, the physiology of fasting, but I had read a little bit about fasting. Let's say you, you, you have an unhealthy diet and now you fast, now the toxins start leaving your body. And I realized that the misery that I felt, the withdrawal that I felt, the weakness that I felt, this life was crummy. The reason I felt like that was because bad things were leaving my system. And I realized, okay, this is actually a good thing. The signs of withdrawal are actually a good thing because bad things are leaving my body. I give you that physical illustration to say it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. You know, oh God, we want to break through, Lord. We want to see more people heal. Oh God, there's no power in my life. And we're crying out for good things, for worthy things, for things that honor the Lord, for things that help other people. But as we press into God, he says, okay, good. What about this? And listen, most of the time, the strongholds in our life don't go without a fight. The key is this. God wants our heart. He wants us. Yes, our financial giving is good. Yes, our service is good. But what he wants more than anything is a heart of devotion, a heart sold out to him. And when we cry out, that's the first thing he's going to deal with. What about this? And What about this? Why? Because he wants us free. Because he wants us clean, just like the toxins leaving our body. God wants the, the junk to come out. And the refiner's fire brings it to the surface. 1988, I went on a 21-day water fast in preparation for ministry at a major conference in Israel. And I would teach on Monday nights. We had a, a ministry school training people, especially for Jewish ministry. And then Monday night was open to the general public. And I would teach and preach on Monday nights on, on spiritual warfare, or prayer, on healing, and prophetic ministry. And, and one, one Monday night, I'm, I'm in the midst of my 21 day fast, I'm preaching and I get to a point that I thought was an important point and I start to raise my voice. And suddenly I hear the Spirit say to me, why are you doing that? Are you trying to look anointed? Do you want to sound powerful? As I'm preaching to others. I'm, I'm having a conversation with the Lord. No, Lord, I, I thought this was an important. I, I thought I was trying to make a point, but why? Why are you doing that? And then another Monday night, where I was teaching on healing. It's not the main emphasis of our ministry, but it's obviously biblical. 
and I, and I called up all those who were incurably ill or chronically ill. We're going to lay hands on them for healing. And the moment I'm about to pray for them, I hear the Spirit say, oh, you want to look like a big man of God. Where did I come from? But God was purging motives. God was going deeper. He was dealing with the things I didn't ask him to deal with. You know, it's like you're having marital problems because your spouse is such a jerk. Oh, let's go to marital counseling. Suddenly the tables turn. I wanted them to clean. I, no, I didn't want to have to clean up my life. January of 2020, so right before COVID, I was preaching at a church in California. About 6,000 people going after God, active in reaching the lost. And the, the layout of the building was such, it wasn't deep like this, it was, it was longer and wider. So the platform was really, really long platform across the front. And I preached on this theme from Malachi 3 of God coming as a refiner's fire. And at the end of the service, I called on people that needed to get right with God or purged to come forward. Many times during the Brownsville revival, pastors would bring their churches. We had cumulative attendance of over 3 million people from 130 nations. We saw more than 300,000 different people respond to the altar call to get right with God. And many times pastors would bring their congregations because, quote, they need a fresh touch from God. My people need to encounter the Lord. My church is backslidden, struggling. They need a fresh touch. And here the service would come, and the pastor and, and evangelist Steve Hill would preach, and there'd always be a similar theme of repent, get to sit out, Jesus came to set you free, and, and exalt the Lord, call for repentance, one form or another, the theme was always there. And then people would literally come running to get right with God. And, and many times the pastor who brought his people for them to be touched because they needed to be refreshed. He's the first one running to get right with God. Now, now think of this for a minute. I'll get back to California in a second. Think of this for a minute. You are the pastor of the congregation. Steve Hill's been preaching, get the sin out. And whatever that sin is, and maybe listing things, if that's going on in your life, you need to get free. You need to turn to God. Jesus came to set the captives free. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. And then that, that, that pastor is the first one running forward, weeping. You're there in his church. You're thinking, what did he do? What's he guilty of? Is he a serial adulterer? Has he stolen money? Did he kill somebody? Because he's weeping at the altar. That takes a lot of humility to do that. But the fire would get so hot, he had to. And I'd see them years later, and they'd tell me, I brought my people there because they needed a fresh touch. I found out I needed a fresh touch. And they say the same thing. I feel like I got born again all over again. So I'm there preaching on God coming as a refiner's fire. And gave the altar call. And this long, wide altar, it's filled with people. They're on their knees and on their faces and standing in there. They're praying and, and crying. God's working in their hearts. And I sensed the Lord wanted to go deeper. It's only rarely that I do this, and I really have to be prompted by the Lord. I really test it. But I felt, no, some people need to go deeper. They won't be free until they make public confession, and they want to. They need to. So I said, listen, I'm not asking you to embarrass yourself or reveal secrets, but some of you, you're under such conviction now. The only way you can get free is if you come on this platform, and you want to take the mic and make public confession. And next thing, that long altar is filled with people standing there. And they're standing there shaking and crying. I remember, give the mic to the first gentleman, maybe in his 40s, maybe a little older. He says, you know, I'm involved in drug rehab ministry. You know, he goes, I'm on drugs myself. And he starts weeping and family surrounds him praying. Little boy takes the mic. Never forget it. He goes, the way I talk to my mommy and daddy, it's so wrong. He's weeping in there, surrounding him and praying. It was a glorious night, glorious night. Well, it had been a full day, full night of ministry. I get back to my hotel, and, and I'm on the East Coast, so now it's West Coast time, so it's late. And I'm just normally at that point, okay, just going to chill for a little while. Maybe I'll do a little writing. Maybe I'll have a snack and just watch sports for a few minutes. Just kind of unwind for a little while. But I thought, no, 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 you need to pray. 
You need to press in. The Lord was so near. So I started going after God and I'm in prayer. And suddenly all these thoughts, this is 2020, it's just a few years ago. All these thoughts start flooding my mind about ambition, about wanting to be known. I said, Lord, what is that? That is so foreign to me. I don't think like that. I don't live like that. I don't care about that. I just want you known. But it was, it was so ugly, so embarrassing. I felt like a little kid full of, full of pride and ambition and, and competition with others. I thought, this is ugly. So I actually journaled it. It was so ugly. It's like, where is it coming from? Is that some satanic attack? Next morning, I realized, you just preached on the refiner's fire, and the refiner's fire came in your hotel room. And there's junk in you you didn't know about. There's stuff still in there you didn't know about. That's why the repentance can be so deep in times of revival. Frank Bartleman used in the Azusa Street Revival said this, that the depth of any revival will be determined by the spirit of repentance that is obtained. The depth of any revival will be determined by the spirit of repentance that is obtained. How, how much do you want God? You just want the outward, you just want the blessing, you just want the excitement, or do you want to have fellowship with a holy God? Listen, the fire is going to fall one way or the other. In Matthew 3, verses 10 and 12, John the Immerser tells the crowds that the one that's coming after him will come with his winnowing fork. And the unrighteous will be thrown into the fire of hell. But then Matthew 3, 11, this same one, this same Jesus, will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. That's why at Pentecost in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, it comes with tongues of fire. That's why when the glory of God is seen on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and Exodus 24, God is seen as a consuming fire. That's why he appears to Moses in the burning bush and the bush is on fire in Exodus the third chapter. That's why when he consumes the sacrifices of Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, fire comes out and consumes them. The same with the sacrifices of Aaron in Leviticus 9. Fire consumes them because God himself is a consuming fire. Isaiah, the 33rd chapter, asks the question, who can dwell with the everlasting burnings? Sinners in Zion are afraid. Who can dwell with the everlasting burnings? You think, oh, that's talking about hell. No, that's talking about the presence of God. Because it goes on to say only the righteous can dwell in the midst of the fire. Do we want a blessing, an anointing, a healing, a prophecy? And praise God for all those. Our lives have been changed. My life's been changed by all of those. Do we just want that or do we want God? Do we want God to dominate our hearts, our minds, our thoughts? Do we want to be consumed with a desire for him? Many times we really want him. And then he says, okay, give this. Not that, up, not, no, not that. But see, it become an idol in our lives. The things become a stronghold in our lives. The thing may be neutral in itself, but it's become an idol that's vied for your attention and vied for your passion and caused you to take your eyes off God. That's what happened with me in scholarship. On the way to my PhD, I got intellectually and theologically proud. And that which was meant to be a tool became an idol. And when I laid it at the altar, October of 1982, in the midst of deep repentance and purging in my own life, and God bringing me back to my first love, as, as, I, as I laid it in the altar at a, at a meeting, to my shock, he burned it up. And nine months, I just sought him in prayer, fasting, and then he gave it back as a tool. Now go ahead and finish the degree, but it's a tool, not an idol. It takes the fire of God to bring these things to the surface. It says about Jesus in Luke, the second chapter. Simeon prophesies over the baby Yeshua and says he is appointed for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. Luke 2, verses 34 and 35. He's appointed for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign to be spoken against that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed. You know, many times we pray for revival and God pours out his spirit, but it's more than we want it. We want it to start a certain time and end a certain time, but don't shake up the status quo. During the Brownsville revival, I wrote a sarcastic prayer for a nice revival. One of the stanzas said, oh Lord, come and quench this longing of our soul, but please, oh Lord, leave us in control. 
Oh Lord, send your glory, send your power, but please, oh Lord, keep it to an hour. <laughs> yeah, we want God, but not the tongue stuff. We want God, but not setting the captives free. We, we want God, but no disruption. But then it goes deeper than that. We want, we'll, we'll take the deliverance, we'll take the healing, we'll take the miracles, we'll take the prophecy, we'll take the tongues, we'll take the controversy. Just don't touch me. Don't mess with my life. Go with me to Mark, the fifth chapter. Mark chapter five, a famous story many of you are familiar with where Jesus drives demons out of a man who was so demonized that he calls himself legion. The spirits call themselves legion, which was troops of thousands of people. That was a legion. So this man inhabited by thousands of demons. And, and he is so lost. Look at this, verse 3. He lived in the tombs, Mark 5, 3. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Then he gets radically set free. Jesus drives the demons out of the man into pigs. They run down an embankment into the river and drown. It creates complete upheaval in the region. Jesus shakes things up when he comes. And, and, and obviously part of Jesus' reason for driving the pigs into the, 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 the demons into the pigs was to demonstrate how many there were and to demonstrate how self-destructive they are. Those demons were in that man. Verse 14, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Now what happens? What happens next? Every city Jesus is in, they're pleading with him to stay. There are more sick people to be healed. There are more captives that need to be set free. Jesus, stay. Please stay. We want to hear more of your words of life. Verse 16, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. They didn't plead with him to stay. They pleaded with him to leave. And that's what often happens, not as overtly, maybe in a more subtle way, but that's what happens to us. We pray, we press in, we want God to touch us, and then he says, get rid of this. Or you need to confess that you need to come clean with your spouse and confess this. You need to go to your leadership and confess this. You need to cut this deal off. You need to break this relationship. You need to quit texting this person. And, and you know, thank you, Jesus. I'm good just where I am. I, I'm happy to serve you from a distance because getting close is too costly. No, here's the truth. Serving from a distance is too costly. Serving from a distance is too costly. That's the reality. Why do they plead with Jesus to leave when they, they've seen one of the greatest deliverances ever in history and the most dramatic one recorded in Scripture? And now this man is clothed in his right mind. The normal reaction would be, Jesus, can you, do you heal blind people too? Because we And, and the, my daughter's paralyzed and... Then we got another person's demonized over here. Could, that would be the normal response. Or it's, could you just stay here and we'll bring the people to you. Like elsewhere in Mark's gospel says, they came running with the people who were sick and carrying them on their shoulders. Why did they beg Jesus to leave? On the one hand, it's too, it's too, much, too much disruption. Too intense. I just preached at a church in Denver, Colorado this Wednesday night annual revival conference they were having. And earlier this year, this is a church that's been going after God and God's been moving. There's been a spirit of revival, a growing spirit in their midst. They heard what happened in Asbury, the outpouring at the, the college there. And the pastor said, Lord, what about us? So they have a Saturday night service, a Sunday morning service. They gathered for church that next week or the week after on a Sunday morning. Lord, what about us? 
and the spirit starts moving in worship, and the worship continues, and now the worship continues, and it's time to end the service, but it continues singing, praising, worshiping, it continues into the afternoon, and it continues into the night, and it continues through the night, and it ends at eight o'clock the next morning. You're talking about like a 22-hour church service. Listen, I've been in church services that are an hour long, and they are dead boring. There's nothing worse than a dead church. A few things are more boring than dead singing and dead preaching. I don't blame people for falling asleep in services like that. I don't blame people for keeping them to an hour. Who in the world wants a 22-hour service? Who in the world wants to, to go home, and when you go home, the Spirit falls on you? You're just about to watch your favorite sporting event, not tonight. I'm not saying you have to be legalistically religious and you can't have downtime or chill time. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that God coming will disrupt our tidy little lives. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But here's the other thing that I see. They see this man clothed and in his right mind. And it scandalizes them. Here's why. You see, if, if his sin, we'll call it triple X-rated, his sin, his darkness was triple X-rated. If my sin is only R-rated, I'm actually a pretty good person compared to him. As long as there are people living a more decadent life than me. They're, I mean, I only watch porn maybe uh, once a week. Or I only do this drug once a week. Or I only steal from the job once. Whatever the thing is. I only gamble one. Whatever the thing is, I'm not like that one. I remember in my drug days, you know, the scripture says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. I remember talking to a junkie who had told me once he had stolen from his mother. And to my shame, I'd actually stolen from my father. And he was telling me, don't give your money to this other junkie. He's going to just take and steal. He's going to claim to do a drug deal for you. You'll never see your money again. He goes, that guy is so low, he will steal from his own grandmother. And I said, but you said you steal from your mother. He goes, yeah, but I'd never steal from my grandmother. <laughs> what happens when the guy who steals from his grandmother now gets radically, dramatically saved? Where does that leave you who steal from your mother? See, as long as you had this crazy, demon-possessed guy acting so wild and weird, then my sin, your sin, is not so bad because he is really bad. But then when he gets transformed and now he's holy and godly, where does that leave me? Uh, Jesus, it would actually be better if you left. Some years back, my wife Nancy had a deep determination in her heart that she had to break through into a place with God she had never been before. And, and had to find him and know him in a way she never did. And it consumed her life. She was always busy working with our school of ministry and other responsibilities. She had just given those over. We were living in a small house, and no yard or anything, so there was nothing to do, a small rental house at that point. She didn't need to do a lot of stuff around the house. And she just had free time. And she began to seek God. I mean morning, afternoon, evening. And she just stayed in one place next to a couch in a little living room. Down. It was a real little rental house we were in. Just on her knees by that couch or sitting there reading scripture. And, and in those days, part of that season, I was doing radio at night instead of in the afternoon. I hadn't gone to afternoon yet. So I come home from doing my radio broadcast mid-evening. I'd walk in the door and the house is pitch black. And there she is. I walk in the door. There she is meeting with God. I felt like I was walking on holy ground. I felt like I was walking into the holiest place. You know, the holy of holies in scripture, Kodesh Kodeshim. I felt like I was walking into that. And, and you could see there was a, a wastebasket next to her, just filled, filled with tissues as she would weep in God's presence. So maybe we'd I'd come in, we'd just begin to fellowship around the things of God. She'd talk about insights she got from the Lord that day and insights from scripture. And we'd be fellowshipping around it and talking things back and forth. But I've had a full day. I've been busy in ministry and, and ministry work and writing and, and now radio all day. And, and it's just, just going to chill for a little while. And I remember I'd, I'd go upstairs. I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to grab my laptop, just do some work and just put on like sports in the background or something. 
And as I'm doing that, it hits me. She's on her face encountering God, and you're going to do that? I wasn't, sin- wasn't going to watch something sinful or watch something unclean or do it. The thing itself was totally neutral. And she wasn't telling me what to do or not to do, but it was just the reality. She's seeking God like that, and you're going to sit there and watch sports. I said, no, I'm not. I'm going after God because something's happening in the house here. That's what happens when the refiner's fire come. It it, it brings up things to the surface, and then I have a choice. Am I going to say, Lord, I just want you. I don't care what it costs. I don't care if I have to humble myself. I don't care the consequences. I've got to come clean. See, you can live at a distance from God with sin in your life for decades. You can live at a distance from God, be church going, even read the Bible, even pray. You go through the motions. I can go through the motions. I can do that. Think of the church in Ephesus. As devoted as they were, Revelation 2, hardworking, orthodox in doctrine, exposed the false apostles, persevered, never denied the Lord. He says, yet I have this against you. You've left your first love. You can go through the motions. I was a devoted, godly believer, known for my witness at NYU where I was getting my master's and PhD. We took refugees in our home from Southeast Asia during the boat people crisis in the late 70s, early 80s. They lived with us for years. We took in others, helped poor and needy. We were living out the gospel. I, I, I was sharing the gospel with the Jewish community. I was a committed believer, but I had left my first love. And I didn't know it. And I was the last one to recognize it. And I was too proud to recognize it. You can live like that for decades. It may be how your whole exposure in church has been. This is what we do. This is what Christians do. This is what believers do. And yet you can still hold on to sin. I mean willfully. Yes, every one of us can have a struggle and a battle and have to resist. But I'm talking about you have your little secret compartment that no one can touch. A funny little story comes to mind. Because I was into sweets so much and my wife enjoyed sweets, you know, different things for each of us. Every so often, we just try to get stuff out of the house because our daughter's growing up. We didn't want to have junk all the time. But hey, we're adults. We can go outside the house and eat what we want. The kids in the house, they're, they're trapped. They can only eat what we serve them. So we had just made a determination. No, no ice cream in the house, no chocolate, no candy in the house. And some friends had come over and given us all these chocolates. And we said, well, just put them in the pantry and save them. But I noticed that Nancy had been eating some of them because they were disappearing. (laughs) One day she said to me, honey, why are you eating all the chocolates? We said, we're not going to have them. I said, I haven't been eating them. You've been eating them. She said, no, I haven't been eating them. You've been eating them. And then we looked at each other. We knew it's our older daughter. She's been eating them. She has broken the rules, and she has been secretly eating the chocolates that no one was to eat because we had taken sweets out of our house. So we were going to discipline her. And I said, "Hun, just before we discipline her, I have to show you something. And we went into my, my study at home, and I pulled open the desk drawer, and there I had hidden Hydrox cookies. That's like Oreos, but I preferred Hydrox. I had my own hidden stash. We're about to discipline our daughter for what she was doing, and I was doing the same in secret. And Nancy said to me, oh, well, let's just go upstairs. (laughs) And we go up to the bedroom, and she opens her dresser, and there she had hidden Reese's Pieces. Our daughter just didn't have the ability to drive to the store and do what we did and hide it. Her sin was more revealing. So we thought, how in the world can we discipline her for doing what we're doing? Friends, I I have seen people who are so righteous. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And their own hearts are corrupt. I've seen people that, that, oh, they're, they're quick to point out sexual sin and porn and addiction and uncleanness, and you watch those bad movies, but they're full of gossip. They're full of impurity, judgmentalism towards others. I had really sensed at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, something fresh was happening in America. 
Not all over, but I was finding more and more pockets that were hungry, that were desperate, that were saying, we need revival, we need a breakthrough. Because in the years leading up to the Brownsville revival, wherever I went, there was hunger, there was desperation, there was thirst, there were people crying out. But, but I, I was not seeing that, I'm thinking, God, this is so wrong. America's getting worse and worse and crazier and crazier, and the church is not awakened. The church is not crying out. And, and I began to see greater hunger, greater thirst, and then I mentioned that message in January of 2020, I preached on God coming as a refiner's fire. And then it's like all hell broke loose after that. COVID happened. And then the racial tension and the race riots. And then all the false prophecies leading up to the election. And then the upheaval over the election. And, and then the, the upheaval on January 6th. And then it was one major Christian leader after another falling or being exposed. One after another. And, and I stepped back and I said, Lord, I... I thought we were in the beginning of a fresh season of revival and then it hit me. The refiner's fires come to America. All the junk is coming to the surface. All the uncleanness is coming to the surface. All the corruption in the church is coming to the surface. All the junk in our charismatic circles. People have these words, 2020 is the year of clear seeing for the prophets. Yeah, revealing how much junk was in our prophetic movement. How much deception was there. Who, it's, it's embarrassing. It's like when you go to the doctor thinking you're doing great, and they come back with the blood test and say, we need to have a serious talk. Or where you get on the scale, it's like, oh, something's wrong with that scale, doc. <laughs> Trying an old outfit. Man, it shrunk, I can't believe it shrunk. I was preaching in Korea, somewhere in the early 1990s. Very intensive schedule. They literally scheduled me for 25 meetings in one week. And, and one day, we just had a small gathering in a, in a room where everybody sat down on the floor. I, I, I don't know how many were in there. I don't think it could have been more than 100 or 200. But it was, everybody squeezed in this room. And I remember distinctly, because in Korean custom, you go into a sacred place or even honoring a home, you take your shoes off piles of shoes. And then my shoes, I was like twice the size of everyone there. My shoes, I was okay, I just bought my shoes. This vividly, I remember that. And I preached on God coming as a refiner's fire. I preached it a thousand different ways over the years, a different way today, but it's been a theme that's burned in me for years and part of my ministry and part of what happens in my own life. And then at the end, people were crying out to God. Remember, this is Asia. So honor is very important in the culture. Saving face is very important, meaning it's better to be deceitful to cover someone than to tell the truth and embarrass them. And once again, I felt people need to make confession. I thought, wow, here in Korea, with a culture of honor and all that, it's going to be difficult. But I felt people needed to. And one woman gets up. So I had the translator right in my ear so I could hear every word. And she begins to talk about problems in her own life. It's, it's not my fault. You haven't treated me right. And I just, st I, I shut it down. I said, true repentance points a finger one direction only. You, you know that the repentance is not real as long as someone else is being blamed. You know, my life's not right. But you, you haven't, you haven't fully repented yet. Because when you fully repent it, you, it's the words of David in Psalm 51 against you, you only have I sinned. God, I'm guilty in your sight and there's no excuse. There's no excuse. That's when the repentance is really coming and cleansing and bringing the impurities and the junk up to the surface. Then one man in anguish cries, begins to speak up. My translator gave me every word. You think I'm a good man. I am not good man. I am bad man. I'm committing adultery. You think of what it takes in a culture like that to make a public confession but see, when, when God comes, it's not an emotional thing. It's not worked up. It's not some psychological ploy. It's the fire comes. He begins to bring this up, and, and he, he, he puts you under holy pressure. It's the beauty of conviction. Conviction can bring up stuff. Some have said, what torture can't bring up, conviction can. And suddenly, you have to get clean. This thing you've lived with for years, you can't live with anymore. You sat through a hundred services like this with great worship and preaching, and then suddenly something happens. I can't live with this secret anymore. 
And you see, God takes no delight in dredging up our past. If we've made things right with God and people, then he loves to bury it. If we've done what needs to be done, it could be something where you need to go to legal authorities. It could just be something between you and your spouse, or you sit with one other person, or a leadership team, or just you and God. But if we will deal with things properly before God and people, then love covers a multitude of sins. But it also says this, the one who confesses and forsakes his sin will find mercy, but the one who covers his sin will not prosper. And today, I believe God's after some things that have been buried in our lives. Well, I don't mean that we got a bunch of rapists and murderers here. I don't mean that everybody is ripping off money from your local church. I don't know if you still pass offering baskets. Well, when it comes by, I take the money out instead of put the money in. I'm not, I'm not saying you're all around thieves, but there's stuff that's in you God wants to deal with. And, and my wife and I, as, as, as we were getting close to the 2020 election season, and most all of our friends, because of conservative moral issues and being pro-life and pro-family and pro-Israel, that most all of our friends would be voting GOP. That would just be the, the pattern of the voting. So it wasn't, it wasn't what their voting tendencies were that were the issue. But we're watching what they post. They became like the world, as nasty, vicious. I'll see it to this day someone's Facebook page. I mean, a minister of the gospel. And here's, here's one post. Beautiful. Here's my favorite worship song just found on YouTube, this new arrangement. Oh, it's glorious. And then another post, God was speaking the scripture to me and it's amazing. And whoa, it's an incredible insight. And then the next post, it's some political meme mocking somebody. I mean, some ugly thing mocking someone's weakness or, or disability or whatever. Or, or when President Biden was running for re-election, mocking his, his, his ongoing senility. And I thought, what, what, what kind of mixture? You know, James 3 out of one mouth, you, you praise God and then curse man. And, and we saw things getting so ugly, so judgmental. People attacking others who had different voting tendencies and things like that. I remember one night, Nancy and I were in different parts of our house. I didn't know if she was still up. We, neither of us were in the bedroom. I don't know if she was up. She didn't know if I was up. I said, where are you? So she was, she was downstairs. I had been upstairs. And, and, and I, I came down. She was sitting on the couch. I just got on my knees, put my head down, and started weeping. I said, what's happened to our friends? I mean, people that were known for Jesus were now the most carnal, judgmental, angry, nasty, mean-spirited, divisive people. It's like, what happened? Friends, God wants our hearts. He, he wants to change us. He wants to purify us. And a lot of the things that hurt us the most are things we're not even aware of. And when you get closer, when you're in a glorious environment like this where the Holy Spirit's moving, he begins to deal more deeply. And today is one of those days. It's often been said that revival is like a mini judgment day. Today is one of those days where God says, stop time, stop everything else. And let's get right. Let's get the sin out. Let's get the impurity out. Let's get the uncleanness out. Whether it's porn addiction, or whether it's holding on to bitterness, whether it's alcoholism or prayerlessness, whether it's pride or gambling, whatever it is, whether it's simply leaving your first love and suddenly it's shouting at you today. You may need to make confession. You may need to get with someone afterwards and get things right. You may, to, you may need to make a phone call and ask someone's forgiveness or forgive someone. But right now, it's between you and God. Right now, it's between you and God. And I'm not here to gain popularity. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to preach a message and everyone's like, Ooh, what a great message. Better you forget my name and forget the message, but God changes you. God changes you. So I want you to stand to your feet with me. Because the Holy Spirit's dealing. As I'm preaching my message, the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you. As a new believer, I had a ferocious temper. A terrible, angry, jealous temper. And I, I got really angry. Someone in our church, pastor's oldest daughter. And I really laid into her just cruel, angry words. And next night, church service. Pastor got up 
and just was preaching. Actually, that night, kind of teaching, going through 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Love is patient. Love is not easily anger. Or reading it from the King James, then charity. It's not easily anger. Charity is not rude. And as he's preaching, just very, with a smile, teaching from the pulpit, I feel like the sword of the Spirit going into my heart. I said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for acting. God, forgive me. Forgive me. I mean, he obviously knew what had happened. His daughter talked to him and his mom. And they were praying for God to turn my heart. And as he was preaching, it's like daggers going inside me. I said, God, please have him stop the message. I quit. I give up. I yield. And then ran forward at the end and said, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. He just smiled at me. Of course, his family forgave me. Friends, the Holy Spirit wants to get some junk out. He wants to change you. He wants you to leave here free from some things and with some stuff that you didn't even know was there. He wants it to leave for good.